Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to another Archive 5. So today, we are going to be doing 5 poetry book reviews. You probably know the drill by now. Basically, in my Archive 5, I take 5 kind of unreleased videos, stitch them all together, and we have one super long video. So, I'm going to put timestamps on the screen down here somewhere, and also in the description box, so you can skip to a specific review if you would like to. And, uh, yeah, let's just get through the books we've got here. So, today, we are going to be taking a look at... The Everyday Poet, Poems to Live By, edited by Deborah Ulmer. The Emergency Poet, an Anti-Stress Poetry Anthology, edited by Deborah Ulmer. Poems for a World Gone to Shit, and this is a collection from Quercus Books. Tangerine Sky, Poems from Malta, this is edited by Terence Portelli. I actually picked this up for free at the Malta Stand at London Book Fair. I will link to my London Book Fair video below. And On the Edge of a Sword by Christina Ehin, and this is translated from Estonian by Ilmar Lepper. So yeah, these are the five books, and I'm going to leave you in the more than capable hands of Past Dane. Hi folks, Future Dane here, just to let you know that Past Dane doesn't know what he's talking about. I say in this that I'm going to merge a bunch of different poetry reviews into one long uh, sort of super compilation but I figure as most of my reviews are really long anyway it'll be nice to use this as quite a short video so without further ado let's take a look at the book this is the everyday poet poems to live by and this is edited by Deborah Alma now what's interesting about Deborah Alma is that her thing is that she's the emergency poet. So she'll go to events and stuff dressed as a doctor and prescribe people with poetry and whatnot. The emergency poet was conceived by poet and writer Deborah Alma as a fun way of bringing poetry to people. A mix of the serious, the therapeutic and the theatrical, the emergency poet offers consultations inside her vintage ambulance and prescribes poems as cures. Dressed in a white coat and stethoscope, and accompanied by nurse verse or a poem edic, she travels to literary and music festivals, libraries, schools, pubs, weddings, and conferences. And as you can see, this is a really beautiful little book. It's a little hardback. This is published by Michael O'Mara Books, and they do tend to do some really beautiful books. One thing I would say is that the different uh, the section breaks were sometimes difficult to spot. They looked a lot like the actual poems themselves. So it's split up into about six different parts. And those are Try to Praise the Mutilated World, Oh Taste and See, The Washing Never Gets Done, Let Me Count the Ways, It Feels Like Going Home, Field Guide, and The Space Where Breath Goes. And obviously those sections are designed to reflect different parts of life. So Field Guide is more about uh, poems about nature, for example. But the idea again with it being the everyday poet is that these are poems that you should be able to relate to on an everyday book basis and it does certainly have that effect i mean there's a big big variety of poets in here so some of the poets that are included here i'm going to read out some whose names you might recognize elizabeth barrett browning emily bronte lewis carroll emily dickinson thomas hardy seamus heaney ted hughes John Keats, D.H. Lawrence is in here, who else have we got? Sylvia Plath, Alexander Pushkin, William Shakespeare obviously, he's always in these, uh, Percy Shelley, Robert Louis Stevenson, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Alfred Lord Tennyson, Dylan Thomas, Walt Whitman, William Carlos Williams, William Wordsworth, William Butler Yeats, so yeah. There's a fair few poets that you've probably heard of from this. And there is a nice mixture of kind of contemporary and classical poetry. I didn't make a huge number of notes while going through this, but I did highlight one or two I wanted to read. The last stanza of this one I liked. This is a long old poem actually. This is On Living by Nazim Hikmet. And it's translated by Mutlu Connock and Randy Blasing. And this is a kind of a two, three parter here. The earth will grow cold, a star among stars, and one of the smallest, a gilded moat on blue velvet. I mean this, our great earth. This earth will grow cold one day, not like a block of ice or a dead cloud even, but like an empty walnut it will roll along in pitch black space. You must grieve for this right now. You have to feel this sorrow now, for the world must be loved this much if you're going to say I lived. Another one I liked was a D.H. Lawrence one, so this is There Are No Gods. There are no gods and you can please yourself. Have a game of tennis, go out in the car, do some shopping, sit and talk, talk, talk with a cigarette browning your fingers. There are no gods and you can please yourself. Go and please yourself. 
but leave me alone. Leave me alone to myself. There are no gods and you can please yourself. Go and please yourself. But leave me alone. Leave me alone to myself. And then in the room, whose is the presence that makes the air so still and lovely to me? Who is it that softly touches the sides of my breast and touches me over the heart so that my heart beats soothed, soothed, soothed and at peace? Who is it that smooths the bed sheets like the cool smooth ocean where the fishes rest on edge in their own dream? Who is it that clasps and kneads my naked feet till they unfold, till all is well, till all is utterly well, the lotus lilies of the feet? I tell you, it is no woman, it is no man, for I am alone. And I fall asleep with the gods, the gods that are not, or that are according to the soul's desire, like a pool into which we plunge or do not plunge. One last one. I don't want to read too many poems because I don't want these videos to be super long. So one more poem. This is Hop in Soda Water, Lord Byron. Few things surpass old wine, and they may preach who please, the more because they preach in vain. Let us have wine and woman, mirth and laughter, sermons and soda water the day after. Man, being reasonable, must get drunk. The best of life is but intoxication. Glory, the grape, love, gold, in these are sunk. The hopes of all men and every nation. But to return, get very drunk, and when you wake with headache, you shall see what then. Ring for your valet, bid him quickly bring some hock and soda water. Then you'll know, a pleasure worthy of Xerxes, the great king. For not the blessed sherbet sublimed with snow, nor the first sparkle in the desert spring, nor burgundy in all its sunset glow, after long travel, ennui, love or slaughter, be with that draught of hock and soda water. That is The Everyday Poet, Poems to Live By, by Deborah Ulmer, the emergency poet. She says on the back, each day is unique, bringing with it different emotions and often unexpected challenges. But no matter the situation, there is sure to be a poem that perfectly suits your everyday needs. This thoughtful collection of verse will keep you focused on the moments that truly matter, lifting your mood, brightening your day, and providing poetic help wherever it is needed. And Deborah Omar has also written The Emergency Poet, which is an anthology of anti-stress poems. So, The Everyday Poet, Poems to Live By by Deborah Omar, I give this a four out of five stars. I think it's a great little poetry collection, a nice mix of the modern and the classics. And yeah, I mean, it just looks really pretty as well. Thank you very much, Pastain. All right, well, I am reading more poetry books, so I probably will do more of those reviews. But in the meantime, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe, leave a like, comment, all that kind of stuff. Let me know what kind of poetry you're into as well, if you're a reader of poetry at all. And in the meantime, I will get back to reading. Yeah, cheers, thanks a lot, bye. Today, I am watching Bubbly Bookend. Okay, hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Emergency Poet, an anti-stress poetry anthology by Deborah Ulmer. So, I'm going to read the blurb to you quickly. So, life can sometimes be overwhelming, but taking a few moments to read a bit of poetry can relieve tension and help you relax and take stock. This thoughtful and therapeutic collection of poems is designed to lift your mood as editor Deborah Ulmer prescribes verses carefully selected to purge melancholy, provide hope and give courage. A bit about the author. Deborah Ulmer is the emergency poet. She travels in her 1970s ambulance to schools, libraries and festivals to offer consultations and poetic remedies to comfort those in need of a pick-me-up for the soul. And this is published by Michael O'Mara Books and as you can see it's this beautiful hardback here. I actually got this just for £3 brand new in the works here in the UK so that's what, $4 maybe? There's another one in this series as well which is, um, it's What's the other one? So the other one in the collection, as well as The Emergency Poet, is The Everyday Poet, which is poets to, uh, poems to live by. And I actually got sent a copy of this when I won a uh, National Poetry Day competition. And it was in with a bunch of books that I got. And I enjoyed it so much that when I saw this on sale, I thought I'd pick it up. So as is the case with me reviewing poetry, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a few thoughts to begin with. And then I'm going to give my rating and then I'm going to read a few of the poems so you can see if it's your kind of thing. What I will say is the layout and the illustrations, etc. are beautiful. It's really high quality paper as well. You know, as an aesthetic thing, it's a beautiful book. And what it does is it brings the different poems together. So there are different sections. We've got For Days When the World Is Too Much With Us, Carpe Diem, Now I Become Myself, Love, Getting Older, Be Alive Every Minute of Your Life, Talking to Grief, Courage and Inspiration, Hope, 
and tonics to lift the spirits. And what I will say is this isn't necessarily my usual type of poetry that I read. I tend to prefer either modern poetry or stuff like Bukowski, uh, Ginsberg, for example. And so this tends to be more, I guess what you would call old school poetry. But having said that, there were some brilliant poems in here. And again, when I take you through them, I'm gonna gonna let you know about them. So I'm gonna give you the rating right now, and it's a four out of five. These these books are beautiful, and as long as she continues to put them out, and I can pick them up for three pounds each time, I'm gonna continue to buy these. I also like as you read through it, it does feel like there's a logical order that the poems are in as well. Anyway, I don't want to waffle on too long because I've noticed my review videos are getting like longer and longer and I don't want to bore people. So we're going to jump straight into some poems. So this is Inessential Things by Brian Patton. What do cats remember of days? They remember the ways in from the cold, the warmest spot, the place of food. They remember the places of pain, their enemies, the irritation of birds, the warm fumes of the soil, the usefulness of dust. They remember the creak of a bed, the sound of their owner's footsteps, the taste of fish, the loveliness of cream. Cats remember what is essential of days, letting all other memories go as of no worth. They sleep sounder than we, whose hearts break remembering so many inessential things. Speaking of cats and sleeping. Boy. Yes, say hello to the internet. Oh, ho, ho. it's a wonder I get anything done. Then we have Leisure by W.H. Davies, and I want to memorise this one. This is partly a note to myself for when I edit it. Apparently, according to my mum, this is the only poem that my granddad knows. My granddad's like a working class dude from a working class town. What is this life if full of care we have no time to stand and stare? No time to stand beneath the boughs and stare as long as sheep or cows. No time to see when woods we pass, where squirrels hide their nuts in grass. No time to see in broad daylight, streams full of stars like skies at night. No time to turn at beauty's glance, and watch her feet how they can dance. No time to wait till her mouth can, enrich that smile her eyes began. A poor life this, if full of care, we have no time to stand and stare. And I actually marked that one out and mentioned it, and this is when my mum told me that my granddad knew it. So it's strange that I picked out that poem, and it turns out to be the one poem that my granddad knows. This is If You Look For The Truth Outside Yourself by Tung Shan. If you look for the truth outside yourself, it gets farther and farther away. Today, walking alone, I meet him everywhere I step. He is the same as me, yet I am not him. Only if you understand it in this way will you merge with the way things are. Okay, and we have here Ordeal by Nina Cassian, and this is translated from the Portuguese by Richard Zenith. I promise to make you more alive than you've ever been. For the first time you'll see your pores opening, like the gills of fish and you'll hear the noise of blood in galleries, and feel light gliding on your corneas, like the dragging of a dressel across the floor. For the first time, you'll note gravity's prick like a thorn in your heel, and your shoulder blades will hurt from the imperative of wings. I promise to make you so alive that the fall of dust on furniture will deafen you, and you'll feel your eyebrows like two wounds forming, and your memories will seem to begin with the creation of the world. We have Song by Christina Rossetti. When I am dead, my dearest, sing no sad songs for me. Plant thou no roses at my head, nor shady cypress tree. Be the green grass above me with showers and dewdrops wet, and if thou wilt remember, and if thou wilt forget. I shall not see the shadows, I shall not feel the rain, I shall not hear the nightingale sing on as if in pain, and dreaming through the twilight that doth not rise nor set, haply I may remember, and haply may forget. This is a Native American prayer, and it's literally, uh, you know, credited to Anonymous. When I am dead, cry for me a little. Think of me sometimes, but not too much. Think of me now and again, as I was in life. At some moments it's pleasant to recall, but not for long. Leave me in peace, and I shall leave you in peace. And while you live, let your thoughts be with the living. And this is Small Boy by Norman McCaig. He picked up a pebble and threw it into the sea. And another and another, he couldn't stop. He wasn't trying to fill the sea. He wasn't trying to empty the beach. He was just throwing away, nothing else but. Like a kitten playing, he was practicing for the future. When there'll be so many things he'll want to throw away. If only his fingers will unclench and let them go. This is another one that I want to memorize and it is a classic poem. 
Funnily enough, the main reason I know this poem is because of the movie Mike Bassett, England Manager, which you probably haven't heard of unless you're British, and even if you're British, you might not have heard of it. But if you have heard of it, you know what I'm talking about. It's great, actually. It's a film about basically this incompetent football manager for the England football team and at one point he's naming his team and he writes them on the back of a cigarette packet so he ends up with two players called Benson and Hedges. Okay anyway, If by Rudyard Kipling. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and meet that treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools, if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you If all men count with you but none too much If you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run Yours is the earth and everything that's in it and which is more you'll be a man my son And this last one isn't even a poem and I like the fact that it was included in here and it's just It's just fantastic I'll read the full thing out to you here Advice concerning low spirits. Letter from Sydney Smith to Lady Georgiana Morpeth, 16th of February, 1820. Dear Lady Georgiana, nobody has suffered more from low spirits than I have done, so I feel for you. First, live as well as you dare. Second, go into the shower bath with a small quantity of water at a temperature low enough to give you a slight sensation of cold, 75 degrees or 80 degrees. Third, amusing books. Fourth, short views of human life, not further than dinner or tea. Fifth, be as busy as you can. Sixth, see as much as you can of those friends who respect and like you. Seventh, and of those acquaintances who amuse you. Eighth, make no secret of low spirits to your friends, but talk of them freely. They are always worse for dignified concealment. Ninth, attend to the effects tea and coffee produce upon you. Tenth, compare your lot with that of other people. Eleventh, don't expect too much from human life, a sorry business at the best. Twelfth, avoid poetry, dramatic representations except comedy, music, serious novels, melancholy, sentimental people, and everything likely to excite feeling or emotion, not ending in active benevolence. Thirteenth, do good and endeavour to please everybody of every degree. Fourteenth, be as much as you can in the open air without fatigue. Fifteenth, Make the room where you commonly sit gay and pleasant. Sixteenth, struggle by little and little against idleness. Seventeenth, don't be too severe upon yourself or underrate yourself, but do yourself justice. Eighteenth, keep good blazing fires. Nineteenth, be firm and constant in the exercise of rational religion. Twentieth, believe me, dear Lady Georgiana, very truly yours, Sydney Smith. And on that note, thanks a lot for watching, very truly yours, Dane Cobain. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Poems for a World Gone to Shit. So this is a collection of poetry by Quirkus Books. There's no real editor name or anything on that listed, so I've just been putting it by various authors. I'm going to read you the back because it's super short here on the back. Discover the amazing power of poetry to make even the most fucked up times feel better. So this was a collection I was sent for review. Uh, I get offered maybe at least three to four dozen books a month. Probably that many a week to be honest. And most books don't really stand out to me but I thought this one sounded interesting. I'm going to read the intro essay here. It doesn't actually tell you again who wrote this intro essay. It says, Okay, so giving you a book of poetry when the world feels like it's falling apart might seem a little bit answer blowing in the wind.
But, as John Milton said, the mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. What he meant was, shit happens. It's how we react that makes the difference. There are poets in this anthology who were writing centuries ago, and you know, they lived through some pretty serious shit. They felt fucked off about the way the world was going too. They just put it in prettier words. So maybe reading what they had to say will help. Here in this little book you will find inspiration to guide you through, from that first instinct to just get the fuck away from it all, via what the hell you can do about any of it, to realising that the birds are still singing. These poems are about remembering to keep looking up at the stars, whatever shit life is throwing at you. And so it's split into five sections, what the fuck, get me the fuck out of here, keep your shit together, let's do something about this shit, and life is still fucking beautiful. I don't think it's going to take me too long to review this book, because my thoughts on it are pretty... <sighs> Pretty easy to, to explain really, I mean, it's fine, it's a collection of mostly classical poetry with a little bit of contemporary poetry put in, it's very much relying on this whole world gone to shit thing as a way to sell it, and as you can tell from like the language that is used in the intro essay and for the heading titles and stuff, I have no problem with bad language, I fucking love it, but, <laughs> but it does feel a little bit gimmicky for me unfortunately, as, as for the poems inside, I don't know, they were just, it was just the same kind of general poetry you get in any kind of anthology of classical poetry, really. It reminded me a lot of the Deborah Ulmer books that I previously reviewed, uh, where, where basically it was like the everyday poet, and it was just poems for your everyday life, and the emergency poet, poems for when you're feeling anxious. And this is just that, but poems for a world gone to shit. Except it's mostly the same poems. There are some good poems in here, don't get me wrong. Obviously it starts with This Be The Verse by Philip Larkin, which I'm going to read out now because I want to memorise this, so note to editing Dane, memorise this. They fuck you up, your mum and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you. But they were fucked up in their turn by fools in old style hats and coats, who half the time were soppy stern and half at one another's throats. Man hands on misery to man, it deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can and don't have any kids yourself. Which I don't have any kids myself. I guess a few of the things that I would complain about is just that... I don't know, it feels like there's like a lot of blank paper here. So we have a little bit of Macbeth there and then obviously just blank paper on the other side. Blank half page, blank page there. We have this one, full page, blank page, full page, blank page, half a page. And actually, as you get in, it gets really sparse. Like, here we go. You get you get pages like this. <laughs> and I was just like, I, d I don't know. I just feel as though there might have been a better way to lay it out. So I feel as though there actually wasn't even that much, much content in this one, unfortunately. What I will say is it does have a wide range of poets. So I'm just reading along. In fact, let's go. We've got some an author bio here. They're in bold, so I should be able to figure it out. All right, here are the T's. We've got Edward Thomas, Henry David Thoreau, Walt Whitman, Ella Wheeler Wilcox, W.B. Yeats, Kate Tempest, Lola Ridge, Claire Parsons, Matthew Pryor, Gil Scott Heron, William Shakespeare, Robert Louis Stevenson, Holly McNish is in here. So you do have a good range of poets, I guess. It did still feel a lot more towards the classical side for me, which didn't make sense. For a book with a title like this. I'm going to read another one here. This is Francine Elena. In preparation for the end times. I plan to construct a secret glass dome. Beautiful to the human, lizard or giant isopod eye. Think of it as a kind of survival curation. A large hot house built for the future. Some walls will house aquariums of angelfish. Other walls will play videos of teen movies from 1990s. E.g. pump up the volume through a fronded canopy of tropical trees. Home to toucans, soda streams and religious iconography. The things I want to preserve forever in a controlled climate after the Arctic, like a poem the size of a basketball court. I am going to read out each of the poems I highlighted here because I didn't actually highlight that many. This one's Kate Tempest's contribution and I literally highlighted this one not because I particularly liked it but because Kate Tempest, she's pretty popular, you know. I've seen her live a few times. I used to prefer her when she just did spoken word as opposed to being a bad hip-hop artist but... Hey ho. So this is The Point by Kate Tempest. The days, the days, they break to fade. What fills them I'll forget. Every touch and smell and taste this sun about to set. Can never last, it breaks my heart. Each joy feels like a threat. Although there's beauty everywhere, its shadow is regret. Still, something in the coming dusk whispers not to fret. 
don't matter that we'll lose today. It's not tomorrow yet. Part of it is that I don't like rhyming poetry as well, so that probably doesn't help. Here we go. Here's another one I literally tabbed because of who wrote it. So this is The Moment by Margaret Atwood. And this reads like, you know, when you post a status and you're like, uh, when you go to post a status and forget what you're typing, and that's the status. The moment when, after many years of hard work and a long voyage, you stand in the center of your room, house, half acre, square mile, island, country, knowing at last how you got there and say, I own this, is the same moment when the trees unloose their soft arms from around you, the birds take back their language, the cliffs fissure and collapse, the air moves back from you like a wave and you can't breathe. No, they whisper, you own nothing. You were a visitor time after time, climbing the hill, planting the flag, proclaiming, we never belong to you. You never found us. It was always the other way around. Thank you, Margaret Atwood. I do want to check out some more of her poetry at some point, actually. This is Ancestors by Nikita Gill. Your ancestors did not survive everything that nearly ended them for you to shrink yourself to make someone else comfortable. This sacrifice is your war cry. Be loud, be everything and make them proud. And I like the sentiment of that poem, if not the poem itself. But what I do like as well is that it applies to everyone, you know. Our ancestors... I mean, there's a thing that Gary Vaynerchuk says, if you're familiar with him. He has a YouTube channel as well. He's like a marketing slash entrepreneurship guru. But he always says, like, the odds of you even being born are so astronomically high that we're all lucky as fuck just to be here. And so when people complain that they don't like their lives or they hate their job or whatever, it's like, well, you're really lucky just to be here for a start. Stop complaining. Second of all, actually do something about it. This is Autobiography in Five Chapters by Portia Nelson. I do like this one, actually. This one, I think this is really well written. It's very understated in its, in its brilliance, I think. I walk down the street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am hopeless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. 2. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place. But it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. 3. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. 4. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. 5. I walk down another street. I just think that's brilliant. I really like that poem. That one was good. And then this is another one. I'm going to end on one that you've probably heard of. This is another one that I want to add to my list of poems to memorise. This is by Edward Lear, and this is The Owl and the Pussycat. Which, if you're British and possibly also American, you probably studied this in school. The owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea-green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five-pound note. The owl looked up to the stars above and sang to a small guitar. Oh lovely pussy, oh pussy my love, what a beautiful pussy you are. You are, you are, what a beautiful pussy you are. Pussy said to the owl, you elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Oh let us be married, too long we have tarried, but what shall we do for the ring? They sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bong tree grows. And there in a wood a piggywig stood with a ring at the end of his nose. His nose, his nose, with a ring at the end of his nose. Dear pig, are you willing to sell for one shilling your ring? Said the piggy, I will. So they took it away and were married next day by the turkey who lives on the hill. They dined on mints and slices of quince which they ate with a runcible spoon. And hand in hand on the edge of the sand they danced by the light of the moon. The moon, the moon, they danced by the light of the moon. Actually I did enjoy rereading some of those poems that I do want to memorise. So for that I do have to give this kudos. It did remind me of some poems that I was already familiar with but that I now want to memorise. So fair play to it for that. But all in all... I don't know, it just feels a bit gimmicky. It feels like the kind of gimmicky book you'd see discounted in the works here in the UK. And you'd buy for like a low price for your mate Barry for his birthday. Because Barry used to be an emo or something. Like, I, I, I don't... I don't think I would recommend it... I don't know, I don't think I would recommend it as anything other... As, than as like a gimmicky gift to get for somebody else. I don't think it'd be worth getting for yourself. I just think there are other collections out there that have better poetry. They might not have as good a, good of a title, but they have better poetry in there and a more, you know, a wider a wider selection of it. 
Having said that, it's fine. I didn't hate this. I'm going to give it a 3.5 out of 5. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's about it for this review. So, as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this. And if not, if you'll be checking it out. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this. Hit subscribe for more videos. And I'll see you soon for another one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Tangerine Sky, Poems from Malta. So this is edited by Terence Portelli. I actually picked this up, I got it for free at London Book Fair when I went to visit the Malta stand. They were giving it away. It's a great way really to get you introduced to Maltese poetry. So I'm going to read you the blurb here on the back. So... This exciting new collection brings together a translated selection of poems written by the recipients of the National Book Prize for Poetry, organised by the National Book Council, Malta, between 2001 and 2013. These poems invite the reader to share the shades and hues of the Mediterranean, the sun that sears the pale limestone and the deceptively calm sea that surrounds these islands, constantly shaping emotions, thoughts, words, images, metaphors, rhythms. These are verses that will leave an endearing mark on their reader, like the subtle scent of tangerines. So the authors, we've got John Aquilina, Jose Attard, Mario Azzapardi, Charles Bazina, George Borg, Luis Briffa, Norbert Bugeja, Joseph Buttigieg, Victor Fin... Oh, this is hard, but I'll keep going. <laughs> Victor Finesh, Joe P. Galea, Claudia Gauci, Albert Marshall, Emmanuel Mifsud, Morris Mifsud Bonici, Akil Mizi. Therese Pace, Joe Saliba, and Joseph Skiberas. And the editor is Terence Portelli, a lecturer in the Facility of Education at the University of Malta. So now you know. So I'm going to go through and read a few of the poems, as I tend to do when I give a poetry review, and then I'll give you a rating at the end. This puts the Maltese language in perspective, and this is from the editor, which is Terence Portelli, and he says, To travel abroad, Maltese literature has to be transferred into an other language, normally, but not exclusively, English. Indeed, the English language in Malta has a history deeply rooted in a long colonial experience, and now its presence as an international language is strongly felt. Within this post-colonial condition, the relationship between Maltese and English is another example of the asymmetrical relationship between two cultures, with one clearly wider and in a more advantageous and prestigious position than the other. Few writers in Malta would consider themselves as bilingual authors, with the rest expressing themselves exclusively in the vernacular. I just think that gives you some interesting context into the poetry itself. So I'm going to read you some. This is a poem by John Aquilina, translated by John Aquilina with Claudia Gauci. So this is your voice, my only clothing. When darkness falls, your voice still clothes me. Dark and naked silence conceals words. Your lips do not touch me, and yet I listen. A seventh sleepless night is yours again, my dreams which have become endlessly you, your voice, my only clothing for the darkness. So this is by Mario Azapardi, translated by Patricia Gatt, and this is called Kamikaze. Or the last will of Fathi Hamad Balul of Palestine to his mother on the eve of asphyxiating sand with his own blood in a final act. Most beloved mother, when this letter reaches you, I will have passed on to the afterlife, where martyrs live as one body, where a man no longer has need of a name or narrative, where no one remembers the iridescent hues of hair or eyes. I am not daunted by the end. Death is merely a pinprick that absolves me of the ailing decrepitude of the incarcerated and the betrayal of life. Death is the unmarked passport with which I enter gardens, where dark-eyed virgins with alabaster-tinged laps will give me the juice of grapes to imbibe and let me suckle on their breasts. Still, I wish I were not going to die. I still would like to come back to you and stroll in the terrain where tamarisk grows instead of blowing myself up body and soul. In the life I abandoned, there was nothing left except a pungent and steely delirium, and the obscene deaths of children still clinging to slingshots. I know I am only leaving behind a memory for a few people to talk about, the date of the attack and my game plan. In this moonless night I heard the beating at the heart of stillness. I dwelled upon my shadow on the wall and thought about the act. In this moonless night, in the anteroom of death, I have tamed all the wild beasts in my head and now all is assuaged and pacified, pulse is under control. I do not have beads of sweat on my brow, no longer am I short of breath or full of passion. I only have the paper and pen and the hours up to tomorrow, the furrow between now and death, the strangest and holiest interval before I make my way to my last appointment wearing sunglasses and a loaded belt. 
Beloved mother, I know that come tomorrow the sun will have to transform itself into a gauze dressing, absorbing the screams and the moans of blood, metal shards, bits of glass, cement and charred guts and bones. I am sorry the price is so exorbitant. Mention my name to Fatima when it rains. Tell her how much I loved her and how hard it was to expunge her name off my chest. Tell her not to weep because I am going to the most luxurious tent next to the river. From there I will continue to bestow blessings upon her. The clock is ticking. Not much time is left. I do not know if I will have mutated into a purple pebble by this evening. The holy signs of heaven are incomprehensible on earth. Beloved mother, remember me just the way you have always known me. May God bless you always. Your son in life and death, Fatih Hamid. Well, that's kind of like more powerful reading it aloud than it is just reading it from the page, I think. So maybe try that if you pick this up yourself. And uh, this is a this is another poem by Mario Azapardi. It just, uh, it's just called Seven, I guess. It's part of a wider work, you see. It says, No, that was no dim light squeezing itself through wall graves. That was primal anguish trying to become flesh in its gnawed memory, where all the murders which convicted him had been committed, where in incubators babes whose wings had hardly appeared lay bleeding. Now he is like a thief of holy relics, with a sentence hanging from his neck, scribbled in a fictitious alphabet, the alphabet of sparsity. Now in that gumless, yawning and terrifying void. This is another Mario Azapardi one. He was probably one of my favourite authors in the collection. This is Death in Camden Square. And it starts with a quote from Amy Winehouse. Luckily, I'm quite self-destructive. Tell them no, Amy Winehouse. Keep telling them no. Tell them it's too late now, and there's no need of an ambulance or an oxygen mask or an autopsy. Tell them no, keep telling them no. Tell them it's no big deal if you forget song lyrics or if you draw a blank or the smudged dates of expired loves. Nor do you need their prayers or pity or flowers. Let them know you tamed your demons on your own mortality wounding them once and for all. Tell them it's futile to pass judgement now that you have played your last card. You've distilled brutal insanity. You've sold everything on your own terms in Camden Square in an hour beyond time unregistered on clocks. You burn incense, priestess. You emptied the chalice and consumed your pains and entered the cavity of a vast night, the dark immense oblivion that wipes out the blackness of the ultimate sleep, the ultimate dose. And you will be remembered, Amy Winehouse, as a tattoo drawn in space, etched with your dark and deep voice, hovering among the planets as you defy gravity and keep on singing no. We have some George Borg here. This is In This Cave. In this cave where glowworms pierce the darkness. In this cave where calm reigns supreme. In this cave where water still streams down the rock face. In this cave where everything lulls you to sleep. In this cave whence we came from afar. In this cave where as droplets we've quivered. Drip, drop, drip, drop, drip, drop. This is Norbert Buyega, translated by Irene Manjon. And this is a poem called Sunset on the Guadalquivir. 27 oranges, that's all your heart can take. Twenty-seven oranges gaze bent low on the Guadalquivir, chugging slowly on, soaking up the tears of this city, inebriated by the crimson death throbbing in the beast's mouth. Twenty-seven oranges chatting on these pale ideas we hold, as we drink in the frothy sun, setting. Olé, la muerte alegre. Oh shit, I said that. Olé, la muerte alegre. Stealthily, twenty-seven oranges, arms raised, look into our eyes, drunk with desire. Two sinners sharing a last beer. Two dark bulls embracing on the sand. 27 oranges. That's all these lines can take. And I like, I don't know, something about that. I, I like the fact that it kind of relates back to Tangerine Sky as well. We have Joseph, Joseph Buttigieg, translated by Priscilla Cassart with Norbert Bugaya. This is Troy, short and sweet, but powerful again. Silent columns of smoke heave up, inciting the skies. At dusk, the horde is drunk on revelry and song. Faintly inside, the horse at the gate, daggers are drawn. It's just a new take on, on the Troy legend, I suppose. We have Well here as well, which I believe is by, yeah, is by the same author. I am water, you are well. I trickle, you don't answer. Not an echo for my drops. Though I'd know you are here, casting shadows of your vault, till I grow sick of this mischief. Okay, so the last thing I want to read is this one called One Must Be Born Somewhere, and that is written by Victor Fenech, translated by Kenneth Wayne. He writes, uh, Fenech writes more kind of prose poetry, so as you can see here, it's, it, you know, it looks almost like prose, effectively. But I think this is a good one to end on, especially considering the theme of this collection. So this is One Must Be Born Somewhere. One must be born somewhere, and I was born here, on this terrace little island, a dry leaf in the middle of a clear, merciful sea. 
In the red moon of sequin skies, I sometimes read my fate. A human reed promiscuously tied to an expanse of rock, collecting on it a rich mixture of languages, races, a puppet people, furiously divided, creating their own sorrows. A rock nest, proud slash submissive, seeking its redemption. A land which one day may flourish, provided it's not destroyed by ecological disaster, political conflagration, wounds inflicted by glass concrete boxes where once dreamed this sweet land. Grant, Lord, that this island runs not aground like Paul's ship, crucified on a reef hidden inside our collective mind, that red-blue wound like the ozone layer we've punctured. Let it fly on the eagle's wings, heart fast beating like a dove's in the eye of a merciless sun. And yet, despite everything, I continue to treasure you, my terraced little island. In you I shall never lose faith, my womb and my grave, my sorrows, my consolations, the land of my birth. So yeah. So anyway, as for a rating, I'm going to give this a 3.75 out of 5. It's not quite a 4. And, you know, it, it holds its own against poetry that's written in English first. Don't get me wrong, it's just there is so much poetry out there that it's really hard to kind of stand out and I don't think it it doesn't stand out enough for me to want to read any individual books by any of the Maltese poets but I am also glad that I did pick up this book and get to know them a bit so yeah there we have it that's what I thought of Tangerine Sky Poems from Malta edited by Terence Portelli so on that note let me know in the comments if you've read this and if so what you thought of it and if not whether you're going to be trying to get a copy hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video thanks a lot bye bye Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of On the Edge of a Sword by Christina Ahin. So this is translated from Estonian, yeah, Estonian, by Ilmar Lethper. And this was actually sent to me as along with a collection of, well, it was Baltic books, so I also got Soviet Milk by Nora Ekstainer, and some other stuff. So yeah. And this is published but this is published by Arc Publications as well. I'm going to quickly read the blurb. Christina Ahin's second volume of poetry from Arc Publications, On the Edge of a Sword, is selected from her latest collection published in Estonia in spring 2017. These are deeply personal, unflinchingly honest, autobiographical poems and as such are a heartfelt defence of the right of the Estonian language to exist and flourish in an increasingly anglicised world. Ilmar Letpair's translation succeeds in capturing the delicacy and immediacy of Ahin's unique voice, once again allowing an English language readership access to this remarkable poet's work. So I've been reading a lot of translated stuff lately, and I think this has got to be up there amongst the best, especially with the translated poetry. There's very little that I've been reading of late that's actually made me want to go and read more by a particular poet, and this has certainly intrigued me enough that I would want to read more Christina Ahin. And I, I gave her a bit of a Google, and she's not like particularly old. I think she's probably around my age, maybe a little bit older. So she's got a promising career ahead of her, you know what I mean? I did highlight a few of the different poems I wanted to talk about. I should also show you as well how it works is that it's got the Estonian on one side and then the English on the other side, which is pretty interesting. So let's have a look at my flags. Yes, yeah, so the poems in On the Edge of a Sword have all been selected from Christina's latest collection entitled Kotyamized, published in Tartu in the spring of 2017. It is the 12th book of Christina's work to appear in my translation, and it has been the most challenging so far for me as a translator, as so many of the mainly autobiographical poems in Kurtomize hinge on specific references to Estonian places, people and culture, most of which would mean nothing at all to non-Estonians. I have left out several poems I would have liked to include because I don't like to burden poems with footnotes, and in any case footnotes would not be able to convey the subtle emotional significance that many of these references have for the Estonian reader. In other poems that I have included, I have endeavoured to make the significance of these references clear in the translations themselves. So I just think that's an interesting little note there that adds some... I just think that's an interesting little note that adds some context. Alright, I'm going to read this one. I don't know what you would call this one because that is the title up at the top. There we go, hang on. That, that symbol. So that's the name of this poem. You lie in the sunlit attic. Stretch yourself out as the light flickers on the beams. You live on sunflower seeds, steal whole days to be closer to yourself. The ice melts in the ditch beyond the fence, and the snow becomes a sea. This spring circles as a seagull over the town, and finally lands on your reef. You have a reflection and a shadow. You are free and able to fight against gravity. Time bound, we burn into ashes. Transience makes our bones moulder, yet in the meantime we let no one order us about. The sun works wonders, makes hair golden, makes shadows fight against reality. The soul seeks release, 
The sun works wonders, makes hair golden. Against the light our core is dark, and our shell shimmers. You wandered to the other side of the planet to see a sequoia. Then you started missing me, but the volcanoes had got going. And although I made you seven league boots, you can't come. Although I sewed you a huge shirt of immortality, you don't fit into it. My dear, you are free, like me and the seagull. You steal whole days. You have a reflection. You have a shadow. And the sun makes hair golden. So, so this is actually called You Lie in the Sunlit Attic. And that symbol just separates different parts of the poem. And this is another part of the same poem. Reality hour. I wind a knitted boa around my wrist. Curl up on the veranda. I feel the eternal heat of my heart's sauna stones. I come to terms with sand and soil. A low, mulchy vegetable patch. Even pushing a plough all alone. To get some honest root vegetables in August. Pretense hour. I want to see myself as one of the country folk. I examine roots too closely and with a magnifying glass. I sing low and step heavily. I convince myself that at summer's end, we simply have to come to terms with fruit flies. Reality hour. I spend all day at a dress fitting. I freeze at Luke Manor House's Park Cafe so that I can see the first broad yellow maple leaves slide down to the ground in the capricious wind. Pretense hour. Stormy sea, shingles too sharp. A muddy pond that has no bottom at all. Reality hour. A surge of despair because of the terror attack the day before yesterday. Copper studs found on a strip of cloth in a field. What parish was the skirt from? What century? Between which wars? Pretense hour. We have to cut these woods down, clear felling, on the lands of Lan, woodland farm. Lay asphalt. Drive over a flying squirrel's nest with a steamroller. Reality hour. A land farm building amid the clear felling. The farm wife who says, sure enough, every forest grows back one day. I don't know, there's just something about these poems that's very hopeful and quite haunting as well. I'm not going to read you all of this poem, but this is part of a poem called Serema Waltz. We are driving through summer, Palu. It is nearing the end of the month of all souls. We are singing poet Deborah Verandi's old Serema waltz at the top of our voices to calm our crying baby. I am at the steering wheel and wonder how the young soldier with the gold star in the song saw that summer night there in the lap of Serema's dewy meadows where he didn't get the flaxen-haired girl. Did it make him angry? And what could he have thought afterwards about that island where the girl let herself be spun about and flung aloft but disappeared before anyone even noticed? Silver says he is more inclined to see shells exploding in this song and that freshly kissed soldier hanging about in a trench and then sent out as cannon fodder. But we have a thousand year long peace now, he says just in case to comfort me, and kisses me cheerfully on my blushing cheek. The Russians were here but not anymore and they won't come either, he assures me. Which obviously taps into the history of the country. And I'm just going to read you here the, bio, the bios on the author and the translator because they both sound really interesting as well. Christina Ehin has an MA in Comparative and Estonian Folklore from the University of Tartu and in her native Estonian she has to date published seven volumes of poetry, three books of short stories, a retelling of South Estonian folktales and a book of autobiographical reflections. Christina has eight books of poetry and four of prose published in English translation. The Drums of Silence, Oleander Press, was awarded the British Poetry Society Popescu Prize for European Poetry and Translation, and The Scent of Your Shadow, Arc, is a British Poetry Book Society recommended translation. 1001 Winters, Bitter Oleander Press, was shortlisted for the Popescu Prize. Her work has been translated into 20 languages. She is a highly acclaimed performer of her poetry, prose and drama, and travels extensively around Estonia and abroad to perform her work, sometimes accompanied by musicians. She is a member of the contemporary folk group Neist Kugis. Christina is a professor of liberal arts at the University of Tartu. And then we have Ilmar Lekper is a translation of Estonian literature, mainly poetry, into English. He has translated 12 books by Christina Ahin, both poetry and prose, and his translations of her work have won a number of prizes. Their collaboration is ongoing. Wandering Towards Dawn, Lapwing, is a volume of Sadie Murphy's original poetry and English versions of Ilmar Lekper's Estonian poems. It has been translated into Macedonian and Romanian. All in all, I thought this was a cracking collection of poetry, and it was interesting to kind of get to know a bit more of Estonia through some of its creative work, I suppose. I only give this a four out of five, and if you're into poetry and or and or have a connection to Romain, uh, Estonia, my bad, sorry, it's because we just talked about Romanian translations, then I would recommend checking this out. So there we have it. 
So that's what I thought of On the Edge of a Sword by Christina Ahin. Don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this review. I'm guessing you probably haven't read it, but if you have read it, let me know what you think. If you haven't read it, let me know if you're going to buy it. Hit the like button if you've enjoyed this. Subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.